So seasonality is considered. So you can see here, uh, the forecast starts in month 36, right? It starts right here. So you can, or it starts in month 37. Uh huh. Yes, and it, it does. So here we have December, month 36. So this is actual values. This is uh, 30, three, 304 is an actual demand number. So the forecast starts right here, January. So you can see it goes from 304 down to 354. Then we hit like April, March, and it goes way down. And then you can see this is our forecast in December. It ramps way back up. So the trend would actually you know, put it in here. And then it is reflecting the seasonality plus the trend in there. So what we want to do is figure out what are the correct values of how much error to attribute to each of these things. And the way you do that is you optimize them. So with, with forecasting and with machine learning, the idea is you have a bunch of inputs and the model spits out an output. And that is the output, right? So like, this is your tweet, this is the prediction, done. Optimization modeling says, hey, you have some things that can change. You have some things that we can make decisions on. In this particular case, we can make decisions about what values we should put each, to each cell here, these three cells. So you give an optimization model the things that it's free to change. You are free to change any of these three cells, so long as they're between 0 and 100%. Give me the right ones. And in order for an optimization model to work, it has to have some criteria for best. What is the best one, right? So when we think about investments, we think about, oh, give me the best portfolio for minimizing risk and maximizing profit, right? When we think about supply chain optimization, it might be um, minimize costs subject to uh, availability constraints. I need this much supply, but you know, send it by boat if you can. So those would be examples of optimization models, very different from predictive modeling. And in fact, we're not going to get to it today, Chapter four of this book goes through optimization modeling uh, using a problem I actually did when I worked at Coke. So, okay, we need to optimize these parameters to be the best ones. What's our objective going to be? Well, we've got one step error here. What we can do is we can square it. We can say, um, what's the mean squared error? So one of the reasons why you want to square the error is because sometimes you get positive errors and sometimes you get negative errors. If you just add them all up together, um, one of the interesting things about the exponential smoothing models is that the errors should basically, if you had enough data, they'll center about zero. And so you sum them up, you're just going to get zero and it's not something you can really optimize. It's better to optimize the squared error because you care about negative errors as much as you care about positive errors. So just square them all up. So over here in column I, I'm just going to square them, right? Um, take the one step error and multiply it times itself. Drag them down. So now I've got a bunch of squared errors. So you can see here this, this 8, this error of 8, it becomes 69. This error of negative 12, it becomes 144. So now they're all positive, very handy. Let's sum all the squared errors up, right? Sum squared error. And we're just going to optimize according to the sum of the squared error. This is a good thing we, to, to optimize on. We essentially just want the model to look at all these things and say, hey, give me the parameter values that minimize this. I want you to smooth out my model such that I have the least amount of error on my known data. So we can actually see it move, right? Like, let's say it make delta 100%. My error just went up, right? Let's make gamma 0.6. My error just went up even more. So you can see that based on these values, look at that, drop another 1,000. Based on these values, I get very different squared errors. So I really want to make sure that they're all, all three knobs are tuned just so. So this is a really simple optimization model. For those of you who've never used optimization models, in Excel you use something called Solver. If you've never used Solver, you've got to add it into Excel. It comes with it, but it's an add-in. So I'm going to tell you how to add it in. I have not memorized this for Windows. And I doubt any of you have the instructions in front of you. Aha, there it is, page 20 of the book. Okay, if you're on Windows, you're going to go to File, Options, Add-ins, and then under the Manage drop-down, you're going to choose Excel Add-ins and press Go. And then you're going to check the Solver Add-in box. 
So it's part of the add-ins menu. If you're on Mac, because they had to screw everything up, you go to Tools, and then you go to Add-ins. And there's going to be a box called Solver.xlam, and you're going to check that off. And that's going to add in an optimization modeling component to your spreadsheet. While you're doing that, I'll show you what we're going to do. This is what Solver looks like. It looks exactly the same in Excel 2011 for Mac as it does in Excel 2010 and Excel 2013 for Windows. If you're using Excel 2007 for Windows, number one, your version is seven years old. Number two, it looks different. But you want to select, uh, if you're in 2007, down here under Select a Solving Method, it should have one called GRG Nonlinear. There's a new solving method that came in 2010, which is four years ago, called evolutionary. Either of these two models are what are called nonlinear optimization models. They're what's appropriate for this model, because if you think about these exponential smoothing formulas, these, these parameters here got multiplied times each other over and over and over again. I mean, it, re it looks really nice in a spreadsheet, but this cell refers back to this cell, refers back to this cell, and they just keep referring back and back and back and back and back, and that's the exponential part. So if you actually write it down algebraically, by the time you hit month 36, there's some stuff that's been raised to the 24th power. So it's highly nonlinear in terms of the decisions you want to make, which are what are the best parameters here. So you want to pick a nonlinear optimization model. So we'll pick GRG nonlinear. That's a gradient descent model. And I want to minimize my sum of squared error right here by changing these three parameters. So by changing cells, I want to minimize the error. A couple of things we want to do. There's a checkbox. Make unconstrained variables non-negative. We want to do that. We don't want a parameter that's less than zero. It's a percentage. It should be between 0% and 100%. In our case, I want to add a constraint then. These three guys here, I got a max of one. You click the add constraint box, you highlight those three cells, you say less than or equal to one. So now we've got make them non-negative, i.e. they have to be greater than zero. Make them less than one. You can be anything you want to be, stay between zero and one. Okay? In 2007, you got to click an options box, I think, to click off that uh, make unconstrained variables non-negative. Yes. No, the sum should not equal one because we did some weird stuff with the trend, if you remember, right? So while the seasonality kind of is like a percentage of how much of the error you left on the table with the other one, so there you had something that equaled 100%, which was alpha and one minus alpha, the seasonality parameter actually says you don't have to take all of that. You can take some of it. So now we know that alpha and the seasonality don't have to equal each other. And then the trend, you actually take only a percentage of the error used by the level. So in each one, they've got full freedom to be whatever they want to be. They can be way under 100% if you want them to be. We're just going to hit solve. If you didn't get this set up or if you're having trouble, you can just copy down my answer. Go through the book later. It's a really easy model and it solves pretty quick. Here are the three parameters it gave me. Gamma is set to one. Alpha is pretty low, it's set to 5%. Delta is set to 10%. Sum of squared error, 2700. This is a lot lower than it was when I was just making things up. So it actually did some really good work there, right? It's like 60% of what it was. We actually have a new forecast down here. Forecast looks different, wow, look at that. We were getting like 405 for December of this fourth year. Now it's down to 367. She pulled it down. So we can copy and paste values, this new stuff, into our graph and look at it. Boom. Looks a bit different. Actually looks more reasonable, right? You don't get this weird hockey stick thing going on. It, it, the trend feels more like it has. So this is it. We have a forecast now with optimized parameters. 
And this is exactly the same forecasting methodology you're going to see all across the industry. Now, a lot of things, and I show this in the last chapter of the book, like R, they use what's called, the, there's a forecast package in there. A lot of forecast packages will run through a lot of models like this. So they'll do one with seasonality, one without seasonality. They'll use some ARIMA models. They use all sorts of different kinds of models, and then they've got some criteria for picking the best one. Here you've only got one model, which is triple exponential smoothing. So people have, have essentially created these um, meta models in the real world that actually evaluate like a bunch. Yes? Mm hmm Yeah. I think for an exponential smoothing model, it's okay. Uh, you could use absolute error. And with forecasting, there are a lot of ways to evaluate your accuracy. One of the best ones is called mean, no, it's called MACE, which stands for mean absolute standard error. And the way this one works, I really like this way. Uh, there's a guy named Hinman, H-Y-N-D-M-A-N. He's kind of like the forecasting guy. Um, he developed this, this error method. And what it does is you create what's called a naive forecast, which is kind of like, not the dumbest thing you could do, but kind of like if you hired a guy off the street who had, uh, let's say, a BA in English, and you said, eh, Here's your spreadsheet, create a forecast model. What would this person do? Well, they'd probably say, um, let's look at what happened. If I need a forecast next month, I'm going to look at what happened last month and then maybe what happened last year and kind of average them or something, right? So you create a naive model like that, and then you say, how does my model that's supposedly really good, how does it do as like a percentage of the naive model? And that, that's a, another good error metric you can look at that's pretty fair. Um, for initializing this one, mean squared error works pretty good, but yeah, you could also do absolute error, take absolute values, and that would affect outliers differently, uh, would weight them differently. So there are a lot of options. Okay, we've got a forecast, but there's a problem. If I were to provide my boss with this forecast, it has no bounds around it. So, I can't say to someone, yeah, I'm forecasting that in December of next year we're going to hit 367, but plus or minus 40 swords, right? You want to provide that to leadership so that you don't get yourself in a bind because a lot of people take your word as gospel because you looked at the numbers, and then when you're wrong, it comes back to haunt you. So it's very nice to actually mathematically calculate it should really be between here and here with 95% probability. So we're going to make a 95% confidence interval, or in forecast it's called a prediction interval, around our forecast. And one of the cool things you're going to see is that as time goes on, it gets wider. Right? You get these one step ahead errors, but now we're having to forecast 12 months out. Month one is going to look kind of like it has been, but then it's going to start to compound, which is really cool. And we're going to do this through a way that's not quite the best way to do it, and it's slightly different than the way we'll do it in the book, but it involves less statistics, and we can do it in the time we have here. And so we're going to run a simulation. So if you've never done a simulation, these suckers are pretty fun. Um, I'm going to actually delete, I'll leave my forecast here, it might not get in the way. So here's a fun fact, and I'm not going to run through the stats behind it, we can assume, given our model that we fit here, a couple of things. Number one, we're going to get just as many negative errors as positive errors. It's unbiased. It's centered about zero. So if we had enough data, we'd see that all of our errors are kind of around zero. If we, if we average them all, it is zero. That may not actually be the case, given that we only have 24 months of data here. It might kind of go one way or the other, because there's very little data. But it should all be about zero, given enough data. Second, future errors should look like the errors we just saw. So that's another thing that we can trust, is that when we say forecast next month and then roll into it, that one step error is going to look like a, a lot like the ones we just had. So these are two things that, that basically come out of academia we can trust. So then what can we do? 
we can just fabricate errors for the future. We can just make them up. And the way we can do this is by pulling ones that we already saw. And since it's kind of centered about zero, we can actually pull them as either positive or negative, right? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say, grab an error from these previous 24. I'm going to use the offset function. So I'm going to say offset, and I'm going to point it right here at G17. This is my first error. I'm going to say, pull G17 or any of the next 23 errors. So offset allows me to provide a row reference. So the row reference will be some random row, rand between, and I'm going to offset it by somewhere between 0 and 23 rows. So I'm either going to pull that row, that error, or I'm going to pull one of the next 23, right? So that's what I'm doing here. So grab one of the previous 24 errors. I'm not going to put in a column key, so comma zero. And then I can either make it positive or negative, right? And so let me just multiply it by 2 minus rand between 0 and 1. So I'm telling it, pull a number between 0 and 1, and then the 2 minus basically says 2 minus 1 is 1. Two, wait. One minus. You guys are better at math than me. Is that going to work? No. How do I get one or negative one? I want to get one or negative one. How does this work? Aha! It's two times ran between. So this is going to give me zero or two now. Then. I'm going to subtract 1. Aha! So it's 2 times ran between 0 and 1, so now that's going to give me 0 or 2. I'm going to subtract 1, and I'm going to get either 1 or negative 1. It's going to take the error I pulled and either make it positive or negative. There is no formula in Excel to get either a 1 or a negative 1, so this is the ghetto way to do that. Okay, so I just put the formula in here. And it gave me negative 1.68. Where is that guy? Right here. Month 22, negative 1.68. So it found it, and it kept it positive. Here's another one, 22. You can see it right there. You'll notice every time I refresh the formula by just clicking it and hitting Enter, I get a different value. Negative 6.2. Oh, look, it's this error, but it made it negative. OK, so it's basically saying you got 24 one-step errors. That means I'm going to pull one of 48 possibilities, right? Now I can take this guy. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to lock everything down. So I'm going to say my offset stays at G17. I'm just going to copy this down. Bam. Now it's pulled random errors for the next 12 months in the future. It just said, these are possible errors you might get that look a lot like the errors you just got, right? Well, now what do I know? I've got a one-step error. Based on that, I can update my level trend and seasonality. So I can up update my one-step forecast. Copy those down. Lo and behold, they compute. And now guess what I can do? I've got an error, and I've got a forecast I can just make up a demand out of whole cloth. Now I've made up a fake demand. Look at that. Every time I refresh these cells, because I'm pulling random errors, I'm getting a new, a new scenario, right? So here I got a real demand of 359. Now I refresh it, 383. Now I refresh it, 388. Now I refresh it, 346. So every time I refresh the spreadsheet, I get a different future based on the distribution of the errors we already saw. So what can I do with this? Why don't we just generate a crap ton of these futures and say, what's the, the 2.5th percentile of them on the low end? What's the 97.5th percentile on the high end? 
that would be a 95% confidence interval, right? I've looked at what's the high end for demand, what's the low end for demand, and I can put them around my forecast. So how does that work? Well, I got the demand here, right? So what I need to do is copy it somewhere. I'm going to take these cells and copy them. I'm going to paste values. Let me do it out here in like column L, okay? Boom. Spreadsheet updates. Let me insert a new column L. I can go over here, do the same thing. Copy, go back over, paste values. Got another example. So I can just keep doing this. This would be a great time to just build a macro, right? And so in this book, and today, I will not write code. That's one of the things I do in the book, is I refuse to write code ever. But I'm willing to record those steps and just play it over and over and over again. If you downloaded the spreadsheet, there may be a macro that's already recorded. You might want to delete it. So in Excel for Mac, you go to Tools, Macros, Macros. You can also go over to the Developer tab, uh, and there's like a Macros button. You click it. And if you have any macros here in this little window, just go ahead and delete them. See, tools, Macros, Macros. So if you have any, delete them so that they don't step on each other's toes. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to do those steps. So record. I'm going to give this macro a name. We call it scenario generator. I don't know. I'm going to give it a shortcut key so I don't lose my mind. That's Option Command on Mac. I think it might be like Control or something on Windows. Hit OK. All of a sudden, my macro is now recording. So what's the first step? Column L. I'm going to insert a new column here, new column L. So now I've got a place to put it. I'm scroll over here, grab these cells, month 37 through 48. Copy them. Go back over to my column L. Paste the values. Paste special values. Done. End macro. Now, that was Command Option Z to run it again. Look, it's doing more scenarios. You'll notice that it like recorded some of my scroll actions. That's pleasant. So it's just running them over and over and over again as I hold down these buttons. You can actually like confuse Excel. I mean, at this point, if I let my fingers up, it'd probably keep running. Yeah. Like, I'm not even touching it anymore. It's just going to go until it's done. There we go. So let me just generate. This is actually, this is a simulation right here. This is what people talk about when they talk about simulation, Monte Carlo simulation. I've got a discrete distribution of 48 possibilities from the past. Each of my errors plus or minus uh, times minus one or plus one. And I'm just drawing them at random, right? So this would just be a Monte Carlo simulation. And now... I've got a crap ton, it's a scientific word, of scenarios. How many do I have? I got L through what? LQ. 318. I just generated 318 possible scenarios, right? Let's go back over here to column K and grab a percentile. Here's my array. Starts at L41, goes to LQ41 in my case because I held the button down for that long. And for K, I want the 0 0.025, 2.5%, 225. Oh, actually, I want to do the 97.5th percentile, too. So let me actually move this over. So I'll put this in column J. Doink. I want the same formula. I'm going to just highlight it and copy the text, paste it here. But now I'm going to, instead of having that percentile, let me do 0.0, or no, point. Nine seven five. Okay. So there we get for January of next year, we get a ninety-five percent confidence bound. On the low end it's two twenty-five, on the high end it's two sixty-six. Copy these down. Can run it all the way through. Why don't we graph them? All right, Excel, please accept 
my graph. So, let's do this line chart again since it's going to grab all three. There they are. The blue one in the middle, I mean, I apologize for Excel's default graphing ugliness, color choices. But you can see that the errors track with the forecast. And if you look at the error at the end there versus the error at the beginning, it's getting wider. Now this particular method, probably at December there, underestimates the width a little bit. So there are ways you can actually broaden it. Um, you'll see in the book that I actually draw from a normal distribution, so I do it a little bit differently. But this is actually a pretty good, just easy way to draw these things, right? So this is something you can provide to executives and say, we did exponential smoothing and we created confidence bounds on it by just simulating demand based on our forecast error. And you can feel pretty good about that. Um, and that way, when your forecast is wrong, you can point back to your slide and say, yeah, but it's within my confidence bound, which I gave you. So that way you don't get fired. So that's that. That's forecasting. Any questions? Yes? You can. Absolutely. So that's one of the things you can do. You can, um, especially in stuff like servers and things like that that have very regular activity, right? So at MailChimp, we know, hey, these mail servers are going to have this kind of activity on Tuesdays and Thursdays, but they're going to have troughs on Saturdays, et cetera. What happens when like a database server, let's say, heats up on a Saturday and gets well over forecasted demand, maybe well over demand on our peak days? Well, then either an irregular event is happening somewhere in the world, you know, maybe it's Whitson over in Germany and there's some holiday we didn't know about, or it could be that someone's in there doing like a SQL dump of your database and, that, and it's hitting I.O. really hard. Let's say we're forecasting disk I.O. Well, is that someone like internally? Is that something we permitted? Maybe you go check or no one is owning up to that. Someone has compromised us. Right? So you can use these forecast models to generate typical, you can also just look at historical data and just grab, you know, summary statistics, right? Um, but the cool thing about a forecast model is it incorporates trend and seasonality. So for a growing business, you don't want to just generate summary statistics because we're growing. You want to forecast out and say, okay, it should be around here and here because this is, maybe it's on a holiday, right? So it's Black Friday. I know it's going to be big, but it should still be within these bounds. And then you can say, hey, this is an anomaly, and that could trigger an alert on Zabbix or something like that. So on your big knock wall, you can say, eh, red light. So yes, absolutely, these can be used for anomaly detection. Other questions? I had a third demo. However, it's noon. There's no way we would get through it before the end at 12.30. So I'm going to release you early. However, I'm going to stick around answer questions, etc. So if you have any questions or if you just want to hang out and work through stuff uh, from either of these two tutorials, I'm happy to sit down with you and look at formulas and stuff and we can work through it together. Uh, otherwise, 2 p.m. tomorrow, I'm going to be sad and hanging out at the Wiley booth. You can ask questions of me then. If either of those don't work for you, let me put my contact info back up. It's somewhere in here. Where was it? Aha! There's my Twitter handle. There's my Gmail address. Feel free to just reach out and, you know, you can give me crap about this talk if you hated it or, you know, you can give me feedback, etc. So, anyway, that's it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, we're done. Feel free to hang around or leave.